Well, today we're not going to be studying Proverbs. We're going to do a book survey of uh, Esther. You remember last time uh, Tom did Nehemiah and Eric did Ezra. So we're now on Esther. And the first thing I'd like to do is share with you a sermon audio series that has been a real blessing to me and my wife. This, um, about six months ago, we drove up to see my granddaughter, Eva, in Michigan, and we listened to this uh, series, a 10-part series on the book of Esther, on the way up and the way back, and it was really, really a, a wonderful series. We laughed, we cried, we discussed. Pastor Borgman did a wonderful job. He's not only in opening up uh, the book, but even secular history with with Persian history and all the things that he brought in. It was really wonderful. And I want to encourage you to, at some point, to go through it, maybe in the next few weeks or months. It's really a blessing. And I pulled a lot of things from that series. I highly recommend it. So today, this is our plan. We're going to look at the book of Esther. We're going to first look at the literary genre of the book, the author, the date of the book, the historical background and setting of the book, and then the major characters of the book. And that's all under background. And then we're going to look at the content under an introduction, a few themes, seven themes that we'll look at, some chapter highlights, which I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through, and then some practical lessons from the book as well. So let's jump right into it. First of all, um, the literary genre of the book of Esther. On the left side, you see the different types of literature in the Bible. The law, historical narrative, wisdom literature, the prophets, the gospels, the letters, and apocalyptic literature. And you see the books on the right side. Now, there's overlap. For example, you'll find the prophets are in historical narrative, and you'll find historical narrative in the prophets. But So this isn't an exact science here, but... Esther comes under that category of historical narrative, along with these other books. And we just covered Ezra, Nehemiah, and now we're on Esther. And at the bottom, if you follow, follow along with me, historical narrative is what? Historical narrative is scripture that gives factual retellings of real events. These books of the Bible are not based on myth. They're based on fact. And as we read, it's important for us to pause and reflect on the fact that these events actually happen. This is real history. Historical narrative comprises 43% of the Bible. God loves to publish accounts of his faithfulness. Next, let's look at the author of the book. Esther is an anonymous work, meaning we don't know who wrote it. However, it's probable that the author was Mordecai because he was personally, he personally experienced most of the events detailed in the book and had access to the historical documents as well as the fact that he had an interest in Jewish affairs. Some scholars surmised it might have been Nehemiah. The actual date that the book was written is also unknown, but obviously it had to be after the reign of King Ahasuerus, or Xerxes I, sometime around 465 B.C. or earlier. Now let's look at the date, the historical background, the setting of the book of Esther. The historical setting of the book of Esther is absolutely vital for our understanding the book. You'll remember in Israel's history, in 722 BC, the Assyrians come in and utterly destroy the northern kingdom under God's sovereign rule. Then, ten northern tribes end up being deported. And then the other prisoners of war from the Assyrian conquest are brought into Israel. So you have a mixture of races, thus we, we know them as the Samaritans. And you have God's act of judgment upon the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom tries to stay faithful. They have some good kings, but because of their unfaithfulness overall, because they abandoned the ways of God, and because they wouldn't keep the covenant, God, in 586 BC, sends in the Babylonians who end up crushing the southern kingdom. It is in the midst of the Babylonian captivity that you'll remember, multitudes were deported off to Babylon from the southern kingdom of Judah. Now Esther belongs to the period after the Babylonian exile, 
when Persia had replaced Babylon as the ruling power. The story is set in Susa, one of the Persian capitals during the reign of King Ahasuerus, better known by his Greek name, Xerxes I. He reigned uh, 1486 to 14, uh, excuse me, 486 to 465 BC. Now, some Jews had returned to Jerusalem where they enjoyed a reasonable amount of control over their own affairs. Others, like Esther and Mordecai, were still left in exile. As a minority group, the Jews were viewed with suspicion and sometimes faced threats to their existence. Still by way of date, historical background and setting, the events in the book of Esther take place between 46 and 465, which puts the book of Esther after the decree of Cyrus that permitted the people of God to return to Jerusalem and after the return of Zerubbabel, who led the first group back to Jerusalem. That's important. So here you have two Jews, Esther and Mordecai, who are living in Persia after Cyrus said, you can go home. It's important for our understanding of the book because they had deliberately chosen to continue in the land of their captivity among the heathen instead of availing themselves of the opportunity to return to Jerusalem with Zerubbabel. So here you have the book that is going to focus on two people, two characters, who in a sense are not where they should be. The zealous Israelites would have returned back to their homeland back to rebuild the temple, back to the holy city, the city of their God. And yet what we find is Mordecai and Esther living in Persian affluence and wealth. Now, the kings of Persia in, Bibli in this biblical period, during the books of Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, you have Cyrus, Cyrus reigned in the latter part of Daniel's life. During Cyrus's rule, Zerubbabel led the exiles back to Jerusalem to rebuild the altar and temple foundations. So this is after Babylon had been overrun by the Persians. Then you have Cambyses, 530 to 522. Then Darius, not the Darius of the Medes. In the reign of Darius, the temple was rebuilt and Haggai and Zechariah were prophets. Then you have Xerxes. And maybe some of you remember the movie 300. Xerxes was the uh, Persian ruler that tried to take over uh, Greece, but was repelled. This is King Ahasuerus of the book of Esther. And then you have Artaxerxes from 464 to 423. More Jews return and rebuild, led by Ezra and Nehemiah during his reign. This was the time of Malachi, the prophet. Now you have more Persian kings right up to about 330 BC. Does anyone know what, what great empire took over after the Persians declined? The Greeks. Very good. The Greeks. And then who came after the Greeks? The Romans. And then that's when Christ returned about 450 years from this period. Here are some facts about Zerubbabel, uh, Ezra, and Nehemiah. I'm going to skip over this, but it just gives some facts about who they are. They led the three, these three, these three people kind of led the waves back to Jerusalem to rebuild uh, the temple and to start sacrifices again. But I'm going to skip that. That's just a little, a little uh, setting. Now, I'd like you to take a look at this, if you will. Now, it's funny because this particular... Um, this, this shows Israel from Genesis all the way up to Nehemiah. And then I have uh, Greece and Rome in the future here. So here's 420 years before Christ. Now, all of this showing Israel should probably be about this size. Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, Greek, and Roman, because those were the huge world empires. This, this group here, the Israelites were just like a, a pinprick on the map. But it, it gives you uh, a kind of a feel for where we're at. So in 930 uh, BC is when uh, the kingdom was divided. Here's Solomon at 930. You have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. 
Then in 722, that's when the northern kingdom, the ten, ten tribes, were taken away by the Assyrians. And then a few years later, in uh, 586, you have the southern tribes going into captivity with Babylon. Now they return, and during that, after that time of return, we have Ezra and Nehemiah, and here's Esther, a contemporary of Ezra, and Xerxes down here is the Persian king. So that's the setting where we are. Um, one of the last kind of um, books in the Bible or figures in the Bible is Esther and Mordecai. Then we have this. This is a map of the Persian Empire that Xerxes reigned over. And you can see um, here's Greece, which is a different color. So he, Greece was able to repel Xerxes. But notice from India all the way to Eastern Europe, down to North Africa, is the Persian Empire. And you've got Jerusalem here, and many of the Jews in exile have come back. But you've got Esther and Mordecai right there in Susa. And they never go back. 127 provinces make up the Persian Empire. So it's good for us to see that this is history. This is real history. When we learn about Mordecai and Esther, it's not just some Bible story, some fiction story that we learn in Sunday school. Here is uh, the Shushan, the citadel or palace of the Persian king Ahasuerus, also known as King Xerxes, who presided over the empire of the Medes and the Persians when, uh, when it was in its height. Notice the capital. The capital is on the pillars from the palace of Shushan. It may be seen today at in Paris at the Louvre. The ceiling of the, of the audience hall would have been about 70 feet. We're talking about an orphan Jewish girl today, Esther, made queen by the mighty invisible hand of God for the salvation of the Jews and the Jewish race and the preservation of the bloodline of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Here's some other photos, remnants of one of King Xerxes' building projects, and then some archaeological finds of Persian archers. I found this pretty amazing. This is the tomb of ancient Persian kings. This is about 2,620 years ago. It's impressive, these tombs back then. We're so smart today, right? We have iPhones and we have wonderful legislators. And wonderful uh, people running for the, the White House. It's interesting, though we have a lot of technology and we put a man on the moon, it's amazing when you look back in history and see what they were able to, to build. Quite an empire was the Persian Empire. So now let's look at the characters. We have Mordecai, an exiled Jew living in Susa near the Persian king's palace, raising his orphan cousin Esther. He progressively grows in faith and courage. But it looks like Esther and Mordecai are a little backslidden, that they're not really uh, strong in their faith. Then we have Hadassah is her Jewish name. Esther is her Persian name, a beautiful Jewish orphan girl whose parents died. And she's being raised by her kind cousin, Mordecai. She ends up being chosen queen as King Xerxes sees her as the most beautiful woman in the Persian Empire. God is sovereign. Well, well, that's what we're going to be focusing on today. It's God's sovereignty. Then Xerxes, or King Ahasuerus, the emperor of the Persian Empire, stretching from India to Greece into North Africa, including Jerusalem. He's a man drunk with power, thirsty for conquest. Then you have Queen Vashti, King Ahasuerus, very beautiful queen, unwilling to parade herself before party guests, who was banished from the empire. Then you have Haman the Agagite. He's the prime minister under King Ahasuerus, who tries to have Mordecai hanged and the entire Hebrew race exterminated just because one Jew refused to bow to him. And Pastor Borgman believes he was motivated by racial hatred, just like Hitler. And of course, we know that that... that that animosity started in the garden in Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman 
would crush the serpent's head. And the serpent wanted that not to happen. And he's trying to extinguish this bloodline of, 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 um, from, from Eve, who's going to crush his head. And all through the Old Testament, we see Satan trying to crush that bloodline. Then we have all the Jews. Thousands have returned from exile, but many, many more are scattered throughout the empire, including Mordecai and Esther. So that brings me to this, this introduction. A lot of this material I got from uh, Brian Borgman, and I encourage you, I'm, I'm just, you know, he had 10 hour s- sermons on this book, and I've got 45 minutes to here to share with you, but he brings in so much more rich detail, and I want to encourage you, email me if you'd like a link to that series. But here we go, the introduction to Esther. The book of Esther really is a wonderful history of God's gracious dealings with his people, even though his people are faltering, inconsistent, and unfaithful characters. The book reveals his providential care for his chosen people. The book reveals his ordering of specific actions and events of pagans and saints alike for the accomplishing of his purposes. Strangely enough, his name does not appear in the book at all. There's no prayers. There's no uh, religious observances. And there's no mention of God's name in this book. The book reveals the proof or vindication of his name. The book reveals the evidence or vindication of his chosen people. It is my hope as we survey survey the book of Esther, you'll be encouraged to read and meditate on this portion of God's word. The light in this book is bright. It will guide you as you seek to trust and obey God faithfully. And the heat from this book is very warm. It will kindle your affections as you seek to love and worship God more. God's providence oversees the affairs of nations and men and on and In every page of the Bible, the book of Esther is certainly no exception to this reality. Regardless of whether or not we perceive or think about it, Almighty God is overseeing the affairs of every page of our own lives as well. But we need to walk not by sight, but walk by faith to understand that. So, like us to look at seven themes of the book of Esther. First theme, the book of Esther gives us the origin of the Jewish feast of Purim. If you're a Jew, you would practice this every year, this festival of Purim. When Haman is filled with rage because of Mordecai, because Mordecai, the Jew, refusal to bow down to him as the new prime minister in chapter 3, Haman, a truly satanic man, ends up casting lots. Now, Haman was not a religious man but he's casting lots. And and the Jews reading this book, they know who controls the outcome of casting lots, but Haman doesn't. To determine what day he'll massacre Mordecai and the entire Jewish race. So he casts lots. And the day that comes up is actually the day before Passover, the day when the Jews were rescued from Egypt. And we're going to see in the book of Esther, they're rescued again. When the Jew would read chapter 3 showing Haman casting lots, they would immediately realize to whom belongs the casting of lots. God controls. How ironic. The book of Esther is full of these types of ironies. The lot fell to the day before Passover. Borgman, in his, in his, ten, in his 10 sermons, he's bringing out all these types of things. And there's so many of them. It's such a rich book. And you see that God is the divine author. So Purim is a feast in the tradition of Jews to celebrate their deliverance from the hand of Haman. Purim in Hebrew means lots. Then there's a pogrom, a systematic purging of an entire race. Well, let's move on. The next theme, the second theme is God preserves his people in the midst of violent anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism has its roots in a satanic strategy to destroy the seed of the woman from Genesis 3. The satanic strategy that we see popping up throughout redemptive history is the devil's attempt to destroy God's chosen people in order to, in effect, destroy the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, the Messiah. 
and one of the most critical points in redemptive history regarding anti-Semitism launched against God's people happens to take place right here in the book of Esther, where you have an Amalekite named Haman who comes up with a strategy to destroy the entirety of God's people. Behind it, Satan's plan to destroy the vehicle to bring in the Messiah. So we have God's faithfulness to his people in Esther. Someone has once said, behind the personal enmity of Haman was a deeper malignancy of Satan, seeking to make void the promise of God to the destruction of the whole Jewish race. And so one of the themes that we see in God's faithfulness is God's faithfulness in preserving his people in order to bring about redemption. The third theme, in the book of Esther, we see worldviews in collision. You have Haman, a practical atheist, believing he could control and manipulate the order of life. And Mordecai, the biblical theist, who believes in divine providence and the absolute necessity to do what's right before God. The whole view of Haman, who ends up being actually the villain of the story, is one who is the practical atheist. He thinks he can control history by his own desires and his own powers. That reminds me of some even today. So he casts lots to bring about his own ends to destroy God's people. He is the one who thinks he's in control. But the irony of the book of Esther is that it shows that he is the biggest fool of all. Truly, a fool has sent his own heart. There is no God. Then you have the worldview of Mordecai. <clears throat> and he's no sterling individual. But by the end of the book, we love Mordecai as he ends up being the biblical theist who believes in providence, but also believes in the necessity of doing what's right at the right time. In Esther chapter 4, Mordecai finds out the plan of Haman to destroy the Jews. So he approaches Esther, and in chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, we, re we read this. Then Mordecai told them, that is the servants, to reply to Esther, Do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place and you and your father's house will perish and who knows whether you have obtained royalty for such a time as this. Deliverance is going to come from somewhere even if you don't do what is right, Esther. God will bring about deliverance because he's the one who's promised to save his people. In fact, if you don't do it, God will do it using some other source and you'll pay the price. And who knows? Don't you love that statement? Who knows? Maybe you have obtained royalty for such a time as this. <clears throat> a fourth theme. Even though God's people may not be living as faithfully as they should or could, they're often called to, to a heroic faith, a heroic obedience and courage in a hostile world. This very theme of God using people who are not living as they should, bringing them to a point in their lives where they're called upon to exercise heroic faith and courage can be a great comfort to us. The book of Esther reminds us that even those who are not the brightest and best can be used in critical points to exercise heroic faith and courage in God. And I, when, I, when I was thinking about this, I, I thought of Spurgeon. I watched a biography on Spurgeon on YouTube by Jeremy Walker. And one of the colleges when he was young, one of the schools, I think it was a, a boarding school, there was a, a lady who worked in the kitchen and she wasn't that bright. I don't, she wasn't college educated, but she knew her Bible and she loved God and she was full of faith. And he said that that woman had a greater impact on him than any professor in all the seminaries and colleges that he attended. So you never know how God might use you. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Then the fifth theme. Even when we're not super saints, God is still faithful to us and still can use us. In the midst of our own lives, there are times when we feel depressed. We feel that if we, we feel as if we have never achieved, we never have lived up to the standards that God has called us to live. 
We feel as if we failed time and time and time again. And we look at the great saints of the Bible and we look at the great saints throughout the history of the church. And oftentimes we wonder if God is going to be as faithful to me as he has been to those who were far more obedient than me. And the book of Esther gives us a resounding yes. God is faithful to all of his people. And that faithfulness does not depend upon our faith, our courage, or our obedience in the entirety of our life. God's faithfulness to his people depends not on us, but upon him. That's encouraging, isn't it? We're going to make it to the end because he's faithful. And so here's Esther and Mordecai in a strange land, having opportunity to go back home. And yet God is faithful to them. Just as he was faithful to Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel and those who actually did go back faithfully. And in the face of overwhelming odds, did what was needed to do by the grace of God. So he was faithful to the obedient and he was faithful to the disobedient. Continuing with this fifth theme, Matthew Henry writes this. How the providence of God watched over the Jews that had returned out of captivity to their own land. And what great and kind things were done for them. We read in the two foregoing books, but there were many who stayed behind, having not zeal enough for God's house and the holy land and city to carry them through the difficulties of a removal thither. These, one would think, should have been excluded. The special protection of providence as unworthy the name of Israelites. But our God deals not with us according to our folly and weakness. We find in this book that even the Jews who were scattered in the provinces of the heathen were taken care of as well as those who were gathered in the land of Judea and were wonderfully preserved when doomed to destruction and appointed to the sh sheep for slaughter. God still preserves them way over there in Susa with King Xerxes. The sixth theme. We see in the book of Esther, the providence of God. It is pervasive in this book. It is on every single page. In fact, as we read the book, we have to admit that this is the whole idea of the book. God taking care of his people providentially, notwithstanding Queen Vashti's insubordination and the wicked king's sleepless night, all is in the hand of God who's working about the events of his own people. Even a beauty contest fits into the providence of God. We see his providence in every page. Everything from his sovereignty over nature, over nations, over individuals, he is in absolute control. His sovereignty permeates the entire book. And of course, as we think about that, is he still in control of my life? The way he was with Esther and Mordecai? We know the answer is yes, isn't he? He's in control. And the seventh and final theme, finally we see Mordecai as prime minister, ruling and mediating with King Ahasuerus for the salvation of the Jews who were threatened by the hand of Haman who is being possessed by Satan. We see Esther also as a mediator of sorts for the people of God. As the drama unfolds, Esther eventually becomes willing to lay down her life for the deliverance of the Jewish people. Esther did, did not know if the king would raise the scepter and usher her into his presence or have her executed by the law of the Medes and the Persians. Mordecai and Esther point forward to four and a half centuries later, when the Lord Jesus would come, the one who lays down his life for his people as mediator between God and sinful mankind. So now, my goal is to go through the 10 chapters and just give highlights and quotes, and I'm, we're not going to have time. So what I'm going to do is just maybe, with each chapter, just mention, most of you are familiar with the story, um, I would like, like to have the time to give the details, but we just don't have time. I want to make sure we leave some time for application at the end. So in chapter one, you have this King Xerxes. And he, one thing in the, in the book of Esther is feasts. There's like 10 feasts. In the, they're always eating and drinking and revel, revel, like having revelry there and Persians. They like to party in Persia. And he gives a feast for all of his officials 
over 127 provinces, they all come for a 180-day party. And he displays his riches. His armies are there. He's showing off. You know, it reminds me of like in the Soviet Union or, or in China when they, they march their armies through. They're show, he's showing off his grandeur. You have a lot of pomp and circumstance. You have a really big party. And, and actually says in the book that the king says you can drink as much as you want. The wine is flowing. Everyone gets to drink. And he commands his servants to bring out Queen Vashti to show off her beauty. Now, the commentators don't agree on whether she was asked to come out naked or whether she was dressed. But either way, she was basically asked to come out and parade herself. And Vashti, it looks like she has some modesty. And she says, I'm not going to do that. Now, to stand up to someone like King Xerxes, this guy's a violent man. He's a debauched man. It tells you something about her ethics and her morals, even though she might not be a believer. Queen Vashti displays some dignity and courage. She would rather be deposed than to be shamed. And there's a good lesson in that for us today, isn't there? When we're shopping for our bathing suit or when we're picking out an outfit to wear, we think of, we think of the dignity that we want before our God. And then there's some legislation that's brought up in chapter one. His advisor surmised that her behavior, her lack of obedience, would cause problems in the whole empire. So a royal order is declared. Banish Vasti and find a new queen. Women throughout the empire shall respect their husbands and men must be masters of their own household. So this was the, this was the advice given to the king. And so they do. They, have a, they actually have a, a, a law that was put out. One of the things that we learn about chapter one and really every chapter is you have the human perspective and you have God's invisible hand. So here we have the foundation for a beauty pageant to look for a new queen because Vashti is banished. So when we read about a drunken king and we read about him wanting to you know, show off his beautiful queen, all of that is is in the hands of God. God's at work using even the wickedness of, of men. So we have human perspective, a wicked king in a drunken rage banishes his queen due to pride and vengeance. But then we have the invisible hand. God is paving the way for Esther and Mordecai to bring salvation to the Jewish people. It's a wonderful perspective. And I think we need the same perspective in our own lives when things happen to us every day. Every day. Chapter 2, um, the beauty pageant to find a queen. So for some reason, Mordecai signs up his cousin. She's beautiful. And, you know, there's questions about why would a Jew, a, a, someone who fears the Lord, sign up his cousin. And Borgman, you know, one thing about studying Borgman and looking at the other the other commentators, he had a very unique perspective and he backed it up with lots of evidence. And he has a take on Mordecai and Esther that at the beginning, they're really far from what they ought to be, but that throughout the book, they progressively grow in faith to the point where they do some heroic things. But yes, she had sex with him. All of these, all of these women had to be tested out. It wasn't like, you know, well, let me pick one and then on our honeymoon we'll have, you know, it wasn't like that at all. Esther won favor before King Ahasuerus. She won grace and favor and he made her queen. The king called for a feast for Esther. Esther continued to obey Mordecai. Now, God is not the author of sin. Esther and Mordecai sin. King Ahasuerus sins. Queen Vashti sins. Haman sins. They're culpable and responsible for their sin. God is not the author of sin. God cannot sin. He's pure. But he's decreed and he's sovereign over sin. Now, can I ex explain that? I asked Pastor Smith one time, said, how, how can we fathom that? And you, I think you know his illustration, which is a good one. He said, you know, man's responsibility is a pillar and then God's sovereignty or providence is a pillar. 
And they, they, the Bible teaches both of them. And they go up, 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 and they, they converge in heaven. And until we're glorified in heaven, we have to trust the infinite God and believe his word. That he is in control of all things, yet we're culpable for sin, not God. And I had to deal with this when, when my daughter died of cancer. I had to look at the Bible and say that cancer came from sin. Sin came from Adam and Eve, which came from the devil. God's not the author of sin. But God in his infinite wisdom uses sin for his glory and his honor. And leave it there. And don't try to be, you know, God. Bow down and let God's word reign. Well, in chapter 2, Mordecai discovers a plot. Two eunuchs who worked for the king are planning to kill King Ahasuerus. And Mordecai happened to be sitting at the gate. Commentators believe Mordecai was like a low-level official. And he heard, he overheard uh, the plan and he reported it to the authorities. The plan was thwarted and this was recorded in a book of the Chronicles before the witness of the king. And the king didn't really pay much attention to it till later in the book when he can't sleep at night. He, he, he says, you know, he calls his servants over, read me the Chronicles. I can't get to sleep. And this is after Haman is, you know, Haman has become prime minister. He's got all the power. He wants to wipe out the Jews because of, of, of Mordecai's uh, unwillingness to bow to him when he became prime minister. Mordecai didn't want to bow. The Jew didn't want to bow to the Amalekite, the Agagite. And this, this made Haman angry. Well, being prime minister, he... He got the gallows built. He's going to hang Mordecai, the Jew. And it just so happens the day before he's going to hang Mordecai that the, the king can't sleep. And he has the chronicles read to him. And one of the chronicles read to him was something that happened many years ago, many months ago, was this guy Mordecai saved the king because he exposed this murderous plot. And, the, and King Ahasuerus said, have we done anything for this guy? Where is he? No, nothing's been done for him. Bring him in. So, um, I wish I had more time. I got six minutes left. It's a wonderful story. It's a, a, a reversal happens where Haman, the prime minister, who built these gallows to, to hang Mordecai, it ends up being Haman, the one that gets, that gets hung. And Mordecai becomes the, the, the prime minister, all because of the faith and courage of Esther who would be willing to go before the king. It's a wonderful, true, nonfiction story. It's wonderful. Well, let me, in the five minutes, I'm going to skip through chapters three through 10, let you read it. I knew I, I, knew I wasn't going to have time. But uh, I want to get to the practical application, uh, pra practical application at the end here. And then I want to read something to you that Spurgeon wrote. And again, I leaned heavily on Brian Borgman, and I'm not ashamed of that. Um, he's an incredible, as is our pastor, Smith is incredible too. But they have different styles. And you'll see when you listen to Borgman, he's got a different style. And um, he says this, two applications that he brought from, from this book. He says, to comfort us, leading us to repentance and growth in faith. The book of Esther is a comfort to us. How is the book of Esther a comfort to us when God's name is not even mentioned in the book? Does that strike you as strange? Here is a book of the, of, of the Bible inspired by the Holy Spirit, and yet God's name is not even mentioned. Some people have found this fact so troubling, they've resisted accepting the book of Esther into the canon of Scripture. Even Martin Luther had a low opinion of the book of Esther early in his ministry but he did teach from it later in life. At the Council of Jamnia at 90 AD, Jews also had resistance accepting Esther into the canon of Scripture. Their number one argument was God's name is not there. And their number two argument was Mordecai and Esther lived in a foreign land and did not return to Jerusalem. But in God's providence, of course, it does not make it into the canon. Excuse me. But in God's providence, of course, it does make it into the canon and is recognized as inspired scripture and is given to us 
for our comfort. The very fact that God's name does not appear actually should comfort us. The fact that God's name is not mentioned reflects that in the course of the life of God's people, God himself can become very small to us. In fact, it reflects to us that sometimes in the course of our life, God can actually be pushed out of the picture by us as far as from our perspective. What we see in the book of Esther when God's name is not mentioned is that their relationship with him had diminished under their influence and affluence and wealth in the Persian world. So they assimilated into this Persian world and they became part of it. For many Jews like Mordecai and Esther, God was far from them or far off to them. The book of Esther teaches us that the providence of God is revealed to us in order that we might be comforted in times of uncertainty, even danger, knowing that God is there and his invisible hand rules the affairs even of heathen kings. One of the sweetest truths, says Borgman, for God's people to lay hold of is this. Next to his redeeming love for us in, in Christ Jesus is to understand that our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. He rules over the affairs of nations, kings, and individuals. Everything from the cosmos to micro subatomic particles that we cannot even see with our eyes and only can see with the most powerful microscopes. And this God is our God who is in control of all things. And it's, he's in control that we see on every page of the book of Esther. And this is given for our comfort. We will encounter times throughout the course of our lives, uncertainty in times of fear, fear, perhaps a fearful diagnosis, perhaps the loss of a job or even the death of a dear loved one. What, what do we need to know in those difficult times? We need to know that our God is in control, that the dark and frowning providence that have come upon us have come upon us because of his design, not simply because the casting of a lot of evil Haman. So the book has been given to comfort us because of the way it reveals God's providence to us. And then secondly, it's to cultivate courage and confidence in God's sovereignty. There is a simple truth that each one of us needs to come to grips with. You and I do not know what will come tomorrow. Politically, we are living in a very turbulent time. Economically, things are probably not as healthy as they seem. And you and I do not know what is going to happen tomorrow. We may find ourselves within a year's time facing persecution. We may find ourselves within a year's time facing tragedy. We may find ourselves within a year's time facing something we would not have anticipated for a thousand years. The book of Esther comes to us for our confidence and our courage because we do not know what will happen to us tomorrow. But we do know that God, we do know that God who is in control of all things has a purpose for us. And it is in the midst of knowing that he has a purpose that we can stand and we can say, if I perish, I perish. It is, it is in the midst of what it is. It is in the midst of that kind of confidence and courage in God that we're able to say, who knows? Maybe it is just for such a time as this, that God has brought forth this or that person. The book of Esther is an inspiration to us, even those of us who do not walk as we should. We should seize opportunities for faith and courage, faith and courage in our witness, faith and courage to stand and do what is right, faith and courage to stand no matter what the outcome, knowing that our God is in control. God does honor those people who heed the call and live for him, even at the risk of their own lives. In other words, in God's kingdom, he honors even reluctant heroes such as Esther. By reading the book of Esther, we as God's people should come to recognize that there is truly a God behind the scenes. We should live with complete confidence knowing that our lives are not, as, are not at the sole mercy of the whims of this world, but are in truth silently and perfectly being directed by the careful choreography of the Creator. It is in light of that knowledge that we can live with confidence and courage in times of uncertainty and even danger. 
May God help us to use the book of Esther not only to comfort us, not only to woo those back who are living in the far country, wooing them back with cords of love and kindness, not only comforting us with his providential care, but also instilling within us the kind of courage and confidence that we need to live in times of danger and uncertainty. Well, Spurgeon will have to wait till next time. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God that reveals how awesome you are, how powerful you are, how wise you are. Father, we are finite and weak, and you're infinite in all your wonderful attributes. We thank you for your infinite love that poured out your wrath upon your Son to rescue us from our sins and from hell. We pray today that you would help us to worship Christ from the bottom of our hearts. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.